Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Blue Oval Podcast. I am Ben Weissel, and joining me, as always, Garrett Zatlin. How's it going, man? Ben, so much on my mind today. Not sure what I wanted to open up with, but as our freshman class rankings have concluded, at least on the, the D1 side, D2, D3 coming later this week, um, just want to shout out to the team. I felt like this was probably the best collective team effort that we've had on these freshman class rankings since we started doing them back in 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, so shout out to uh, everyone on the TSR team. Thought they did a really nice job. Um, but yeah, and I just I just want to give them some kudos there. The amount of research, especially on the women's side, that where yeah. <laughs> some schools had like 12 recruits and i i was like reviewing some of the data today and i was just like blown away by certain classes just having like literally a team's worth of freshmen coming in it it was it's staggering and and the fact that like our our team was able to catch all of them is a testament to their thoroughness and and detail-oriented approach yeah, I mean, it was, I, I loved it. It was like, it was just a great effort. The research was there. Oklahoma State women had 14 new names. Um, and God bless Mara for just writing that. Like, I, I felt <laughs> bad because she, she could only say the same thing so many times, like, just because there's 14 different names. But um, yeah, shout out to the team. Shout out to everyone who contributed there. We still got D2 and D3 as we're recording this on the way. Um. Ratings and reviews. I think the last I checked, we had plus one on Spotify. So slowly but steadily, pretty decent. I haven't checked Apple since earlier today. Uh, but yeah, let's try to get those up. Again, I know we always say this, but rookie numbers. Let's get them up. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 everybody's kind of slowly getting back into the groove after the Christmas holiday and New Year's. I We understand, but now you're back at your job. Now you're on your commute. You're back to school. You're listening to the podcast. Once once you're done with your drive, just click that rating and review and, and boost our numbers a little bit. We would love that and really appreciate that. Absolutely. So, all right, we'll stop badging you uh, about the reviews um, for today. Ben, uh, the past week for the site has been unbelievably insane. Um, we have had a handful of different pieces of news that we've reported on the site. Where, where do you want to start? Because I think we've got a, a pretty interesting and fun episode today with everything that was just broken. Let's start with the earliest beginning to the coaching carousel that I can really remember. Like, well, obviously, Chris Selinski going from Florida to uh, Oregon was the first kind of piece in that puzzle, something that was obviously surprising just on its face, but the timing also was rather stunning. And so that leaves a hole in Florida, which someone needs to fill. And that in turn is going to leave a a hole. And we're just going to be seeing some of these programs just get thrown into chaos here. And the, the name that we reported on that is filling Selinski's hole is Will Palmer of Alabama making the switch to SEC rival and leaving a very, I think, valuable and very interesting uh, role open at Alabama, which we'll talk to more about more later. But him going to Florida, I I think this is an A plus hire for Florida. Like if you if you don't have Selinski anymore, go get the guy who's been producing some of the best women's teams in the country uh, and certainly in the SEC over the last few years. Go steal him from your one of your direct rivals. Bring in Will Palmer. I thought this was a huge hire for the uh, University of Florida. Phenomenal hire. Phenomenal. Um, I think I think there's a lot of questions about what Parker Volpe does. Um, mm-hmm. We don't really know. Is she going to transfer? Is she going to stay? Is she going to Oregon? Is she looking somewhere else? And I do think, and this is just from an outsider's opinion, um, I do think it mattered who was hired, right? And so if you're Florida... You can pretty much go to Volpe and say, hey, we just got a podium level coach. Uh, He's developed in-state talents. He's developed international talents, Juco uh, transfers, the whole nine yards. And oh, by the way, all of those women, four women in the top 20 last year, he knows how to work with high level, high octane scorers like Parker Volpe. I thought I, I agree with you. I think it's huge, but huge because now I think they have at least a shot at retaining uh, Volpe. But I would want to also ask you this. What was your reaction when you heard like, oh, he's going to Florida? Because I've heard a bunch of different mixed reviews. 
in terms of whether or not it's a good move for him? Uh, well, sure, that or just your surprise factor or any of that. Uh, I'm not. I, I wasn't too stunned to to hear that he would be going to Florida. I, I think what Selinski has proven is that can be a uh, a leaping pad to a bigger, better job. Um, I, I think getting the opportunity to um, again still compete for national championships on the track side, along with Florida's really good track and field program, I, I think is big. I think he gets to maybe uh, it possibly elevates his profile by getting the opportunity to build up a, a program kind of like he did uh, at Alabama once again at Florida. Um, I, I think this is kind of just a, a test. Uh, he wants to test himself. He gets a new opportunity with Florida, and I, and I, I think I like it. Um, I, I might be in the minority there moving liking the move from a established powerhouse at Alabama to one that's kind of on the up and up but I I think it makes a lot of sense and I think he can build his profile out a little bit more at Florida I had one buddy of mine who's very deeply connected within the sport um specifically the D1 level and of course you also look at some of the comments that people are leaving under you know our, our news there and a lot of it's like, but why is he going? Why is he going? Like Alabama is so much better than Florida, at least on the women's side, um, for those well, just distance events in general. Yeah. And it's like, well, he's going from just the women's program to now the men's and women's program. Mm-hmm. He's going to a Florida program that overall is maybe the best overall track and field program in the NCAA, yes. period. Um, I think, like you said, that improves his status there. Um, he has a newborn, and I imagine that with this move comes a pay raise. So, I, and as I, someone with a newborn, the pay raise is always something to be very focused on. Exactly, and that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, it just matches up. It matches up really well, I think, for where he's at in his career. Um, and so, I think it makes sense from that point, especially because I think, like you said, he can use this as like a leapfrog to somewhere else where it's either a more established distance role at a distance based school or to a director role. And right now, he's doing great. Here's the only thing that I have a question about Does the recruiting from international names and over at the JUCO levels, I think a lot of like Hilda Alamamwe, Flamina Asakal, mm-hmm. I don't know about Mercy Chalangat. Maybe I think Mercy Chalangat was like a at a mid-major maybe, before coming to Alabama. But there's questions now I have about what is that recruiting going to look like? What is the international presence going to be at Florida? Is there going to be an international presence at Florida? Um, And I don't know. I really don't have a good answer for that. I would be surprised if there was much of an international uh, presence uh, just because of the cost uh, of those recruits and transfers. But as we just have seen from Florida's recruiting class this past year, Slinsky was able to still re- bring in a good group. Obviously, it's not necessarily brimming with people that can turn into the next Olamami or Chilean God or, or whoever, but it's still a good class. And, and you would imagine that Palmer is going to be able to do much of the same. It, it's just going to be a lot more development um, into maybe all Americans rather than title contenders and and you just it's so hard to get those title contenders obviously just through recruiting um a lot of times you see that through transfers or through international presence um but i i think he's going to have enough tools to be able to put together a nationally competitive team whether that means they're top 20 i don't know but i think this is still going to be a team that should at at least as its goal be making nationals and I, i don't think that him going there is going to prevent him from being able to do that. Okay, now I have two entirely new questions. First question, how long until the Florida women get back to the national stage? On cross country, I should mm-hmm. say. Second question, where, what percentage did you give Parker Volpe to transfer out of Florida after Selinski left, and what would you give her the percent chance now that Palmer is hired? I think before, so the second question I think is very directly related to the first. So the second, the second one, I think there were like, I, I think she was as good as gone uh, after Selinski left. I, I think it was like 60, 
Like I, I, I thought it was pretty high after, after this higher though, I, I think it, they, there's still a, a chance, but I, I would drop it to like 30, 35%. Um, I, I think there's still a good chance, but I, I think like you said, bringing in someone who has trained women at her caliber before it is huge. And I, I think would be a big confidence booster for Volby. And if she doesn't want to leave her school, leave all the things that she's been comfortable with and grown into this runner, this type of runner, then I, I think he's a good excuse not to, to do that. Um, as far as whether or not they make na- like nationals, I think they can make it next year if Volby stays. But I, I, I think, I think that with, if she's not there, it's at least two or three years. Um, I, I'm with you a little bit on the percentages, uh, maybe not as severely as the, in the drops as you. I thought, okay, 60, percent chance, maybe 60% chance that she leaves. Um, now I think it's like a 50% chance. I don't think it makes that much of a dramatic difference. Um, I think Palmer being there helps. I just don't know if like, oh, well, now I'm going to put the house money on Volby staying. Um, right. And again, just for everyone listening, we have no idea. We have zero clue. Mm-hmm. Just like everyone else. We're just as curious as you. We're just speculating, having fun with the conversation. Um, the second part, though, the, well, my first question, I completely disagree. Um, I think it's going to take a really long time. Um, I think it would require a red shirt from Volby. Um, and then, like, get in, like, well, she has two more years of cross country eligibility, I think. Mm-hmm. So I think it would, like, require, like, a red shirt so that she gets, like, that third year. And then they build up the classes and bring in a transfer to along then, and then maybe they get back. But it's tough because you you either have to capitalize on what Florida has in the next two years to get them there, or she has to redshirt, and maybe year three you get there. But I just think you're starting to do a lot. I don't know if this program right now is in any position to say like, oh, well, they're going to be top two or three in the SEC. And usually in that case, that's what's required to get to the national meet. So. We'll see. I'm just not there yet with Florida. I think Palmer's great. I think he's a, the probably the, the best hire or one of the best hires that they could have had. I'm just not there with Florida yet. I'll have to see how the next year or two works. I guess I'm just trying to think through the South Regional. Obviously, Alabama is still probably going to be the favorite going into next year. But Florida State wasn't exactly striking confidence in me. I, I don't really Lipscomb was solid at times this year. Ole Miss, I, I I again not not really confident in their ability to be a national com- nationally competitive team. I think Tennessee's still a year away. I I just think there it, it's open, and, and I mean it would involve a transfer or two. I think that that Palmer would have to bring in, but. I, I think there there's a little bit more of an open door to nationals um, in that South region, which could accelerate things a little bit quicker than maybe you expect. Yeah, and, and you know what? That's fair. I think it's a very fair point to say, hey, Florida, you know, they're not in a great region, and they re- actually return a ton of women yep. from their regional lineup. But there were 167 points. Top two was 80, you know, second place Florida State was 88 points at their regional meet. Like they just, they have to chop down their score almost in half, basically. And yeah, about in half, roughly. And you take a look at their lineup, like they had three women in the top 26 point scoring, but then they had four women 60 points or higher. And it's just like, you, you got to start finding a little more scoring potency and just someone to start bridging these gaps. They're they're getting beaten by Georgia Tech, Tennessee. These are teams that they probably should have beaten already if they want to yeah. be in position next year to get to the national meet. That's why I think it's going to take two or three years, depending on what happens. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's certainly going to be a challenge um, to make it next year. But um, I, I think he breathes some some new life into this Florida program, who obviously already had a very strong coach um, with Chris Zielinski. Um, but you, you never know what a new face can kind of do to re-energize a group. Um, but yeah, I, I think it'll be super exciting to, to watch and, and see how quickly he can build a program. We, we, we've seen this, I think, a lot more in the last few years where the, a new coach is coming in and tasked with kind of not necessarily rebuilding, but kind of re-energizing a program. Um, and this will be his opportunity to do that. Let's switch gears, though, from the Florida side and, and talk about um, maybe the hole that he's leaving 
at Alabama. Obviously, there's. Um, I think Mercy Chilling got is going to be out of eligibility uh, after this year. Am I correct in saying that? I believe so. Yes. Um, and the next piece of news that we're uh, is directly tied to, and uh, maybe not directly tied, but um, part of this conversation of Palmer leaving Alabama is Amaris Tanisma has also entered the transfer portal. So this is suddenly, if she's leaving, this is an Alabama team that is going to look dramatically different next year uh, than the team that Palmer coached this current year. Um, it, uh, do you think that that played any role in Palmer leaving in terms of the turnover that was maybe expected at Alabama? Um, you also saw freshman Sam McDonald uh, head to UCLA. And this It seemed like Alabama at least on the women's side, is experiencing a lot of turnover and, and that maybe pushed Palmer to be a little bit more open to this Florida idea. Yeah, I, I think McDonald, well, that McDonald, I think, is unrelated to Palmer. I think right. that was already set um, for her to try to like make that move. And we'll talk about UCLA in a moment. Um, to Nisma, yeah, I think it has to be stemmed and related. Um, I, I, you know, the reason why we're, we're recording this Sunday, January 8th. If you haven't seen an official report on the site yet about Tanisima being in the portal, that's somewhat intentional. That's why we're telling you now on the pod. We can tell you that she is in the portal. Um, but we, what we can't tell you is that whether, where, where, what kind of transfer situation she's doing. I, we don't know if she's a grad transfer or regular transfer. Um, and we also don't know. Uh, when. Yeah, when. Exactly. We don't know when, when that would be. So it's tough to say. Um, I do think it's related, um, but it, but also like I kind I kind of get it, you know. Like Trelang got's about to leave, um, her coach is gone. Uh, I think she's she's about to finish her undergrad degree, so it makes sense if she's now in a graduate position where she's like, ah, oh, I want to venture elsewhere. Where do you, where could you see her landing? So I I have two two names um that I I've written down. What, what we we could say that we do know of interest in at least one school where she she's made a visit. Um we won't go into the specifics on that, but uh a top level school where she is already going to visit. Um but outside of that, I think North Carolina makes a whole lot of sense. Um it, it, this is a program on the rise. I think I've probably mentioned them before when it comes to possible transfers. They, they're coming off a, a very strong NCAA performance, finishing fifth. They have a lot of women coming back. It's just prime for someone to come in and give them that extra boost to make them a podium level team. I, and, and I think she gives them that. She gives them a almost, when she's healthy, uh, all American lock, someone who is going to be probably a top two, top three scorer for them, and just elevates their ceiling and potential so so much. And Tanisma gets to run a- alongside a lot of great women as well, um, and gets to be a star on the track. I-, I think it makes a lot of sense for her and North Carolina. Uh, I get that. I don't know if that's the first one I would have said, but like you know, you you make a good case for it, especially because. She's there. How do I put this? She she gets to grow. She gets to like be like the exclamation point for a team that's trying to make the podium. Yeah. Um. And I think it's actually a very similar situation with Virginia. Mm-hmm. Virginia loses Mia Barnett, and now they're saying, "Well, wait, could we just get pretty much Mia Barnett, like two years older, with Amaris Tanisima?" Yeah. I I think she would actually be a good fit. Mile centric runner who can do very well on the cross country course. It was actually significantly better than Barnett on the cross country course, yes. um, and they were ninth in the nation last year. Returned almost everyone, if not everyone. I think it's six of their seven. Well, now five of their seven. Um, and if you're Tanisima, you're like mm, that. That team could maybe sort of kind of get on the podium. So I would think Virginia there. Uh, do you have another one? Because I do have another one. I almost said Virginia as well, and I think I would have if Barnett was still there. I think that okay. makes a lot more sense in terms of, all right, look at this team who just came ninth. They they return almost everyone. You have a rising star in Barnett that you can run with uh, on the track, and then you can be kind of that, that exclamation point like you could be for North Carolina. The other team I have is Notre Dame. I think Whoa. this could be Katie Thronson 
2.0, uh, a much better uh, version. Um, but Katie Thronson was great for this team. She was 68th at NCAA's uh, third score, just was super consistent throughout the whole year. Um, she's going to be gone, I believe. Um, and so plugging in Tanisma in for Thronson, where where you have a lot of the this, this main part of the lineup is going to be back. Markovic, uh, Strelecki is going to be back. Chisholm's going to be back. Like this, this could be a team that does make the podium uh, this year after finishing seventh, despite possibly losing a, a few other names. And, and I, I think Notre Dame's proven that they can integrate someone very quickly. Uh, and I think that transfer makes a lot of sense for both parties as well. That's the last team I would have picked. I, I just, I don't see her going there. I don't <laughs> think, I just, I just don't. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't think Notre Dame has the same history in the mile that a few other programs That's do. Fair. Tanisima is an Alabama native. I think it would make sense if she wants to stay at least somewhere in the South or the you know, Southeast mm-hmm. coast. Um, it would be a big I, change. I just, I don't see that. I just don't see it at all. Um, I mean, for, from like a prestige standpoint, sure. Um, now that said, <laughs> now that said, speaking we did of this things, last time with, with pal, where you're like, I, I don't see it. And then go with someone very similar. <laughs> I don't know how similar this is, but the, I, I am contradicting myself a little bit. Oregon. Okay. I, I think the difference there, though, is that Shalane, Jerry, there's a little more star power. The, the, they return a good number of women. I think if they just get more firepower via Tanisima, this is a dramatically different team, like a team that could maybe sort of kind of possibly be on the podium if some of those younger women develop and progress over the next year, and they bring in another stud, like I'm sure they probably will. Um, they've got a very good recruiting class. You know, I think Jerry and and Shalane could probably, um, you know, develop her kind of into like a, the mile centric 3K runner. Um, that they, you know, they've got a few great milers there as well, like Izzy Thornton Bot. They've got a, this Polish, new Polish girl in who's like a 434 miler. There's a lot of things that line up there. Also, wouldn't it be wild if she went there and like she was now working with Selinski, who <laughs> yeah. Palmer just took his job? So um, I don't know. I just think like in terms of skill set, Oregon would be a fun place for her. I don't think that's like, where she's going to land. I think she's going to stay somewhere in like the East South Southeast kind of coast, but um, I just kind of like that fit. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that makes sense. If you're going to go uh, have that big of a departure, just go all the way, go, go all right. the way to the West coast as far away as you possibly can. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. Another, another school that I'll throw out um, a little different. Uh, again, this is going to be a, a big move for her. Um, but I, I think that Colorado, um, makes a lot of sense from a school that knows how to develop middle distance runners. They have Bailey Hertenstein there. They, they have a a very solid infrastructure, obviously great coaches, and they desperately need someone to fill in, stabilize that lineup in cross country, provide some more firepower up front. I, I think that, it, it's very similar to the Oregon situation of, I think things are ready to go for her to improve. Um, and I, I think they give her, uh, I think Colorado is probably a step or two ahead of maybe where Oregon is, at least on a cross country side, um, and, and could be a very, very competitive with her in their lineup. How... Well, she she's not going to Florida. We don't think, right? Well, I I think someone threw that out there in the the maybe our our Slack, and that would be interesting. Um, tell, I, I Vol, tell me, Volby and Tanisima would be so much fun. Yes, yes, and, that would and, be and, awesome. Oh yeah, and, and that's and that's kind of what I maybe where some of my optimism comes from. Palmer is I I wonder if he's going to be able to pull one of those Alabama women with him. And maybe it's Tanisima, maybe it's somebody else. But if if you know that Volby's staying, I, I got to imagine that Coach Holloway would give Palmer a little bit of room to be like, all right, let's go get like one or two others. So we, we're scoring a few more points, especially in the middle distances. Like you get Tanisima in there, you get, you get Volby scoring points in the 5K, you can get Tanisima scoring points in the 1500, the 3K indoors, like 
then that becomes a lot more of a well-rounded proposition for a Florentine that's very hyper-focused on what points they can score at the track national meets. DMR possibilities yeah. as well open up because they've got great middle distance runners. I think it'd be fun. I don't know if that's going to happen. I would love for it to happen. I think Volby and Tanisima would be one of the most exciting one-two punches in the NCAA. Um, but yeah, uh, speaking of potentially uh, taking one talent uh, that you know to, to another school, let's talk about UCLA. So let me uh, lay this out. I got a text one morning from multiple coaches. And this is when you know <laughs> that like someone just entered the portal. It's Mia Barnett, Mia Barnett, Mia Barnett's in the transfer portal. I'm like, huh, I wonder who's in the transfer portal. Um, so worked on it, worked on it, finalized it, and we report it, right? Wow, big move, surprise. Less than 24 hours later, Sam McDonald, and we actually were about to report it, but we got beaten on it. Sam McDonald announces she's going to UCLA to join her former high school coach from Newberry Park, Sean Brosnan. For my NBA fans out there, this feels a little like the when Miami. Kawhi Leonard. Oh, no. What? Okay. Yeah. I was, was going to say big three. No, this feels a little bit like when Kawhi Leonard was working in the depths of the night. Yeah. And he said, hey, Paul George, jump ship. I'm going to go to LA. LA, LA. See the connection there? Mm-hmm. And let's go make something big. And then he just dismantled uh, the Thunder, although they got a good haul out of it. Um, yeah. That's kind of like what this feels like. And like, I think it was like a stun that like Barnett left. And not that like we're, you know, not that we don't understand that like she wants to be closer to home. She made that very clear in her post. McDonald, we totally understand why. But over the night, it was like Sean Brosnan just like went snap and he just completed a massive heist. It was. One of the one of the more impressive transfer developments I've seen within the past, like within a twenty four hour span. I'm not surprised that your phone was blowing up when Barnett hit the transfer portal because it's extremely rare to see someone with that much eligibility, like th- this young of a star, be available. And I am sure that almost every school in the country was sending her an email, letting her know that they were interested because. Not oftentimes you get to see someone who just finished 44th at NCAAs in cross country, which was, I I think we can both agree, the best cross country result she's ever had. Um, Mm -hmm. A a huge improvement for her. Um, But also, it's just a star on the track. 411 the 1500, 206 in the 8, 433 in the mile. Like, she is a legit star um, across multiple uh seasons and i am not surprised at all to see her be super attractive to every single college coach in the in the country and for sean brosnan to get her to come home to ucla is just a huge building block along with mcdonald for him to build this program like you can build this is the foundation of a Uh national qualifying team like those two names alone you can you have plenty of years you don't have to do it necessarily next year but you you have this foundation of which he can now say hey we already got the infrastructure let's go maybe pluck one or two let's develop some of our young freshmen and hopefully we can grow this internally and then maybe add a piece or two this just gives him so much more flexibility and raises their floor dramatically that, I, I mean, it, it is, like you said, it's a heist. And, and I, I think your comparison to the to Leonard PG uh, transactions is, is apt because it just took that team to a different level overnight, and, and this is exactly the same here. I, I still think UCLA has a lot of work to do. I mean, they've got to actually develop McDonald further. Yes. Um, Barnett has to be more consistent on the grass. They've got to great, get more scoring support. They've got to actually develop some of the strong recruits they have into mm-hmm. top tier talents. It's going to take time. Um, I don't think I think this is a good base and foundation, but I think they need more. But I agree with you. It's long term, uh, a really nice pickup, a pair, nice pair of pickups. The, the thing with with Barnett, why I think this came as like such a surprise, is because 
you know, we, we can, okay, you can understand, all right, she wants to go back home. That makes sense. But it's more that you rarely see someone who is having such great mm-hmm. early success. She just seems to be getting better and better with each passing season. Just comes off a cross-country season where we didn't really expect her to be a factor. We didn't expect UVA to be as good as they are. UVA has one of the brightest futures of any distance school in the country. And this is a Virginia Tech grad saying that. I, I hate saying that, but it's true. <laughs> like, um, they do. It, it's it's the craziest thing. So, like, just you know, strictly, and I know people are maybe going to get on me about this. Strictly on the track and on cross country, I, I I thought if she was like, there's no reason to leave, and so that's why it, it took me by surprise. I I wonder. I think she got on the portal pretty quick, and I think she also knew knew where she was going. That was surprising. I don't know how that happened, but you know, it was, it was interesting. It it's the <laughs> kind of transfer that you expect from like a mid major um, athlete or or someone who's uh, on a, a star for a team that's never going to make it to nationals or a. a, a a, an athlete who wants to train with better runners it's that it's that kind of move but this is someone who's at virginia who like you said it is has all those things and, and so to forego those for a uh rebuilding team it is surprising and, and i i think ucla made sense if she wanted to go back to the LA area, but there was plenty of their other options on the West coast that she could have gone to that would have been upgrades or would have been, uh, I think made a lot more sense, uh, in their life cycle compared to UCLA's. Um, so yeah, I, it, it is just an interesting move all around. And, and I think what that tells me is one Barnett really wanted to be in LA and two, Brosnan's selling them on something that's going to happen maybe a little quicker than maybe we expect. Um, one of my buddies, when the news came that she was on the portal, it was, um, <laughs> he called me and he goes, where are we thinking? And I go, well, the only place I can like realistically decipher by reason is UCLA, but I don't think she's going there. <laughs> <laughs> like, He's like, well, why? I'm just like, well, I don't know. Would you rather go to Stanford or UCLA right now? He's like, yeah, good point. Um, but yeah, I guess I was, I was overthought it. So shout out to Barnett. Um, I guess this now has, has me wondering, who, what's next? Mm-hmm. Who else are they going to get? What does this mean for the recruiting? And also, what's happening on the men's side? So they, they, they just landed some stars. What does this mean on the men's side? It, it seems like the he's struck out a little bit on the men's side. Um, and it seems like the money is being focused on the women's side because that's where they, they've seemed to have the most success. So I, I, I honestly, the, the pause there was, I, I don't know what they're going to do on the men's side. And, and this might just have to be a longer rebuild on the men's side than maybe Brosnan was expecting or wanted because he didn't get any of his former high school, like stars to, to make the leap. Um, the young twins going to Stanford, Solomon going, uh, with his brother to NAU, like it's, it's going to take some time unless they can swing some big transfers. And again, we, we, we say this and I, I need to be better about this because these things can change so dramatically. Mm -hmm. Like we weren't expecting Barnett and McDonald to be uh, headed to UCLA a week and a half ago. Like this was not really on our radar, but in today's age, where more and more athletes are going to on the transfer portal, um, where we're seeing coaches be more and more aggressive in terms of pursuing transfer athletes, things could change rather quickly. And and I, I think that's also why I think we're going to see a lot more. This isn't going to be the last big transfer on the women's no. side for UCLA. No. We're going to see at least one, maybe two. That, and that, that's not me coming with any inside knowledge of, of knowing anybody. That's just me reading the tea leaves and, and kind of seeing where things are headed. And I would not be surprised if UCLA's top five looks 100% different next year. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to look different. Um, I'm, I'm going to give them time. I'm going to give them Brosnan a summer 
to actually say like, hey, I'm going the transfer portal. I'm going to pick up some guys and see what happens there. I, I think there's UCLA is way too attractive of a distance running program to not have a few top use like you know men's yeah. distance talents at least be interested. I think he's probably going to get one or two. Um, I think what's going to happen is what happens two to three years from now. Like, is there a situation where he gets to you know one of his former uh, athletes on the Newbury Park side? Um, mm-hmm. I mean, probably unlikely, but you know, like you know, Mc- McDonald just went from Alabama to UCLA. So you know, how unlikely is that? But yeah, I, I don't really know what to expect on the UCLA men's side. Um, but Brosnan, shout out to him, man. I, I was like, I, I think we didn't really know what how he was going to approach, like how he was going to attack this roster construction. I, I think he just made a very big statement to the rest of the NCAA, saying, "Hey, like we're we're going to be." a legitimate problem for you in recruiting. And, and, the, and the best part about these two is that it does give him time. Like he's not, yes. this isn't kind of trying to microwave a roster and be like, I got to do it in a year before the, these athletes leave. He has leeway. And that's the biggest part about getting Barnett and McDonald is they give him a much longer runway to develop. He can add, he can be a little bit more choosy about the people he adds. He doesn't have to go and just get a grad transfer with one year. He's going to be looking for that next trans, that next star on the portal who has two years of eligibility um, and, and go after them. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, LA heart of big 10 country. It, it's, it's, it's hard. It, it's, it's an attractive place to go. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see, Obviously, as they do move conferences in the next year or two, um, how that also maybe changes the way things are recruited, the way they're able to compete. It, it, there's a lot of unknowns there. I completely forgot they're going to the Big Ten. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. It's just ridiculous. Like, why are we? Why are it's we so to- funny. It's I, I, I like the heart of Big Ten. I saw a tweet the other day. It was like, they're just forgetting that. USC, UCLA, you're in the heart. You're in the heart of Big Ten country now. And it's just like it, it's it's a hilarious, hilarious, and just lays bare the the fact that conferences don't care about geography, don't care about anything except for the dollar signs. Um, I'm looking at the Big Ten performance list from this past spring because I just want to see what that 1500 area looks like mm. for these women. Um, Olivia Howe. Bailey Hardenstein, who's not there anymore. I mean, there's a slew of women in four, at fourteen, uh, four fourteen. How is four twelve? I think she's a four hundred nine PR though. But mm-hmm. based on just the Tifers leaderboard for the Big Ten last year, Barnett is at, at the top. She she will lead it. And you know, obviously things can change over the next couple of years. But I think that just gives you a good idea of like, hey, Barnett's not just great on the grass. Like she's going to be likely a potential Big Ten champion. Mm-hmm. And as I look through the the mile stacks here, yeah, it's the same thing. It's Hal at four thirty three, Hernstein at four thirty five, Kahoot Jackson's gone. Carlson could be a problem in the future. Jo- Johnson's probably more of an eight hundred meter runner. But like McDonald, even with her four thirty eight PR, is already one of the better milers in the Big Ten. Eventually, once what they make that switch. So, um, if this was the Pac twelve, I don't know how I'd feel. But I think because they're going to the Big Ten these two transfers are just that much more impactful. And they're not going next school season, school year. They're going I knew the you were going to ask right? me that. I knew you were going to ask me that. I, 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 I just looked it up. I, I, I believe okay. it is 2024, 25, but both obviously will still have eligibility um, in, in two years or a year and a half from now. Yeah. As early as 2024 was what was originally reported. I don't know if that has changed. Um, yeah, I don't know if, that, if that's changed. But by then, you'd wonder, okay, Mc, McDonald kind of has like a little bit more of a firm grip on it. By that point, you're wondering if Mia Barnett can challenge for a national title. Um, I think they'll, they'll on the women's distance side, UCLA will fit in very nicely in the Big Ten. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just going to be fun. Um, obviously, as we've hinted, this is not going to be the last news that I'm sure we're going to be hearing from NCAA over the next few months. Um and not only that, we're gonna someone's going to have to get hired to fill Will Palmer's role. We we already have heard a little bit of news uh, about possible candidates there, um, and whoever leaves, that's going to leave another hole. That I don't know if someone's going to try to f- if a school is going to try to fill that right away or wait till the the summer. But there's going to be a lot of moving and shaking 
um, already in January. Like the off season has come very, very early. Um, and, and this is not going to be the last bit of transfer or coaching news that we're going to be reporting on for the next few weeks. Man, um, just when you think, they put like, back in. yeah, just when you think, you know, it was the whole Selinsky news, and then it's like opens the door for everything else. Um, this is why you do it. Love of the game, man. Um, ben, that's all I've got. Uh, shout out to my brother for uh, getting me a monitor for Christmas. Ooh, he's like, nice. hey, yeah, he's like, hey, you're an adult now. That's why you're looking at me from a different angle. Um, he's like, hey, you're an adult now. You need to stop looking at your laptop. And I was like, Psh, you don't know what you're talking about. And now I can't, uh, I can't imagine life I, I don't, without it. I can't imagine life without this. I don't know how we ran a website from a laptop. It's just insane. So question for you. Do you have the laptop up still and then the monitor on, yes. on one side? So you're, you're dual screening. So I, I have the dual monitors for work and I'm like, I, I'm with you. I, I don't know how I did it before. I'm interested in a third monitor. I think that would be <laughs> really helpful. You will, no, you will quickly realize that you'll be like, ah, oh, man, two's great. And then you'll go like a few months back. You know what? A third wouldn't be the worst. <laughs> thing in the world it gets like it, it is a game changer so yeah i'm i'm curious to see you as you go along your development on your monitors i'm i'm gonna be like that scene in the dark night where in the bat cave and then there's just like all those like yes. thousand different screens it's like me trying to look through tifers pages and just uh five just screens on the- tifers three on instagram two on yeah. twitter just like yeah you'll be good to go yeah uh five on doordash so you know whatever <laughs> works All right, Ben, that's all I got on my end. Uh, You have anything else? That's it. Until next week, Garrett, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you.